Welcome back to an all new Car Stubs adventure. I'm really excited for this one. Flew all the way to Maui, Hawaii, taking the classic road to Hana trip. It's one of the most difficult roads in the United States. Full of waterfalls, black sand beaches, and just gonna be an awesome adventure. And I think I got the perfect car for this. The good old Jeep Wrangler. Now this road is a lot, there's a lot of skinny, dirt, gravel, uh, washed out roads. In fact, the bridge just washed out the other day. So I was like, I gotta go big. We gotta get a Jeep. This is a Sahara model. It's got a lot of miles on it though for a rental. It's almost 50,000 miles. So let's see how it held up. We'll try to get the roof off and we'll probably put it in four wheel drive a few times. All right, on the start to the road to Hana, it's obviously beautiful as you would expect. About 20 minutes from the airport, the first stop is gonna be Twin Falls. Supposedly there's a lot of cool waterfalls and swimming pools in here. The Jeep so far, it drives like a Jeep. It's windy, it's kind of loud, and there's a weird little noise I'm gonna to try to capture again. Not sure what that is, but otherwise it's fun to drive. First off, just got to Twin Falls. About to head back and check this out. Twin Falls, gorgeous spot here. Just a quick walk from the parking lot. Just out on the river, the trees in Hawaii are amazing. This one's really cool. Here's a little tip. The first falls you come to are technically Twin Falls and most people just turn around and get back in their car. But if you keep going, the payoff is worth it. There's an even better waterfall further up the trail. It's huge. I purposely didn't look how to take the top off on a Jeep. I've never done it before. It doesn't look too difficult, but let's see how this works. First, I'm gonna flip the visors down so we can get access to everything. And I'm, I'm gonna pretend that didn't happen. We'll, we'll put that back there. Anyways, I think you just got these little handles here pop them off at the corners and it looks like there's a latch what does that do oh that was really easy and just like that open top the passenger side was the same as the driver's side now we don't have like a garage to throw the panels or anything in so it is probably gonna bang around the back but that's what a rental car is for let's see how this goes it is now officially a true jeep and i should give you some context to why that visor fell off that was not supposed to happen Someone was probably rough on this and pulled that right off from there very easily. As you can see, the electrical connection is also gone and that would mean the light no longer works either. At the beginning of the road to Hana, there's all kinds of chickens and roosters running around. Just off mile marker seven, you can go right off the road and there's these really cool rainbow eucalyptus trees. Really big, there's just a few of them and you can get right off the road without having to pay or anything and check out what these look like. Pretty cool. The road was pretty nice and smooth until about mile marker 25 or so and now I'm really glad that we chose the Jeep, even though it doesn't look too bad. It's still pretty shaky. And this car, I like it when you're driving slow, not so much when you're driving fast. So I don't know if the noise is coming through, but I think it has something to do with the air conditioning and the compressor, but it's making this whining noise. But I turned the air conditioning off for a minute and it still kept going. If you listen, you can hear it really close. If there's any fellow Jeep owners out there that know what that might be, please let me know in the comments. Okay, just got to the Airbnb. I'm staying out, the driveway looks a little sketch, so I think I'll put it in four wheel drive. Let's go. Disappointingly, this doesn't come with HID headlamps, just standard halogens, which would have Really been nice to have the HIDs on this road to Hana. These are not very bright. This is the regular headlamps and fog lamps on. And as you can see, it's still, as you can't see, I should say, it's still pretty dim. Turn the corner here. You can see the difference between that and the brights. So those are regular headlamps. I'll turn the brights on right there. It's not much of a difference. Those are brights. 
regular and brights again. So while the Jeep Wrangler does have push button keyless start, I realized they'd still put a key very accessible on the pad. And I didn't know why, but now I realize because most of the newer cars have a one touch button where you can get into the car, but this one still has the old school metal keyhole. So you see. Well, didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> and another reason to have a key on the fob would be if you have the top open, you can lock some of your valuables up in the center console like that and get back in. It's a rainy day here in Maui, so I thought I'd give you an overview of what the dash looks like. You still have regular dials. You have your tachometer here, and we'll get to this in a second. Your four-wheel drive, temperature gauge, fuel gauge, speedometer in the middle. Obviously, your what gear you're in, the miles. Like I said, just about 50,000 miles on this, and a standard speedometer. Uh, the wheel is pretty much standard Mopar. It has those weird back buttons to do stereo functions, which I kind of like, but they're a little awkward to get used to. You have automatic headlamps, fog lamps, your mirrors are in the door, but your windows switches are actually not in the door. They are all in one center spot, which I don't mind because it's actually more efficient. You don't need a button on every single door. You got a, a 12 volt accessory there. You got some USB plugins. There's a USB-C as well as a regular USB and an aux cable if you're still rocking the iPod. So as a regular shifter, which is cool, with manual shift mode, which is probably whatever on most of these, no one's gonna use that anyways. And the center stack, have you ever driven a Mopar before? It's pretty standard, the Uconnect system. Uh, it does have CarPlay, you do need to plug it in. You can access your climate control from here as well and all your buttons are down here too. But this one doesn't have any display on it, so it does help to actually see what you're using with the climate control. So if the screen ever went out, you're kind of out of luck with the climate control, although it would still work. You don't really know what you're doing. Um, auto start stop, turn it off, which I recommend doing all the time because I can't stand auto start stop. You have mute buttons, traction control off, hill descent control. You can turn the screen completely off if you want to which could be kind of nice if you want to focus on trail riding or whatever it may be. Center glove box, you get a little mini glove box on top and then inside that, an even bigger one along with another USB switch. The door panels are pretty beat up as you'd expect from a rental. Um, the materials are actually pretty soft and it is nice though, but they do feel durable at the same time. I notice these map pockets are really worn out on every single door. Like check this one out. Uh, same materials in the back. Back seat is actually quite big for this, even though the whole car doesn't feel super large. Um, once again, no speakers in the doors. They do put them above the top. So if you want to take the top off, take the doors off, you can still use your stereo. And you get a couple cup holders back here along with a real outlet and some USB plugs and additional window switches here as well, along with some climate control. So while the top is really easy to take off, there's not really a designated storage area. So you just gotta throw them in the back and that kind of sucks, especially if you got other luggage and they rattle around and hit each other. As you can see here, they scrape pretty easily and the top is black, but underneath is white. So it shows off really easily how much it scratches. I guess an alternate option would be to put them in the back seat, but then they're probably just gonna do that. No real good spot to keep these, to keep them from rattling around. I finally figured out how to do the transfer case properly. You can just crawl a little bit, put it in neutral, and then you can shift down to 4H. So now we're in four high. Drive it a little bit in four high. And if you wanna get to four low, go back to neutral, put the transmission in neutral, and then all the way to four low. And now we're in four low. And then to go back to two wheel drive, same thing, just go back to neutral, shift it all the way up, back into drive, and you're back in two wheel drive. This is why a Napa Napa Park, I know I'm butchering these names. The Black Sand Beach, lots of cool volcanic rock over here. So really neat spot and some treacherous waves. So 
I wouldn't suggest going in the water. And just on the other side of that cliff is an arch. And the actual, really only section of beach I found so far is over here. Down here at the Black Sand Beach, you can see the consistency of the rocks. Not necessarily beach, more like playground rocks. This is why Moku Falls, it's amazing. It's over 200 feet tall. All right, now as you probably know, the Jeep doesn't have an actual hood latch inside, so you gotta pop these off. And then there's one more latch here. Let's pop that. Under the hood is a turbocharged two liter four cylinder engine. Now there is also a 3.6 liter Pentastar engine that I talked about on my Dodge Charger review. I'll put a link to that here. Uh, both engines have about the same horsepower. This one puts out 270. The V6 puts out 280. It's pretty good, probably enough that you need. If you really wanna modify though, I suggest going up to the V6. That waterfall was a really long hike, so I need a nice spot to relax. This is Homoa Beach. So as you can or can't see in the center dash or info screen, when the lights are on during the day, it's really, really hard to read. But at least you still have the uh, standard speedometer on the right side. And it rains a lot here, so your lights are gonna be on a lot during the day. So don't expect to get much out of that center screen if your lights come on during the daytime. Not only is there a black beach, but also a red beach right in the town of Hana. Well, one Jeep that wasn't so lucky right there. I should also mention that you don't want to get a car that's too wide or too long. There were a lot of Suburbans, Yukons, Expeditions up here. Uh, that wasn't the only accident that we saw. There was two head-on collisions with two Suburbans earlier too. And I just passed by someone that was on the left side of me going the other direction on a wall and they scrape their mirror. So you gotta be careful about being too wide. I think the Jeep is just the perfect size. Although after seeing that one rolled over, I'm starting to second guess. If you're in a hurry on this road, you're probably in the wrong place because you're gonna run into things like this. We're about 10 minutes in on the wait here and there's no way across. It's a one lane bridge while they work on it. Sadly, last day in Hana, it's so beautiful here. If you like waterfalls, there's no shortage of them. I, I lost count, there's at least 50 or more. But that Waimoku was amazing. It's a long trek to get back there, but definitely worth the hike. And I think I picked the right vehicle. I don't wanna say I'm converted to a Jeep fanboy yet, but it is pretty awesome. And pick this if you're taking this trip. There are so many people that we saw taking convertibles, or just regular passenger cars and bottoming out or even having flat tires. Saw a couple of people using their donut spare tire, which would be really terrible on this road. And I'm not sure you could even make it back to the airport to get a real tire or return the rental car. Uh, luckily with the Jeep, you do get a full size spare tire in the back. Should that happen, knock on some kind of fake plastic that, that doesn't happen. We're almost wrapped up here. Let's start with the good things. Obviously it's a Jeep, it's fun. The steering is soft, but you get used to it. And you're especially um, on these slow roads. It actually, it's kind of nice. It's like you're floating a little bit. And the top, I can't emphasize like how easy it was. Cause I think I remember back in the day, these Jeeps used to be a horror story just to get the top off. So it's super easy. The downside is I showed you earlier, there's nowhere to really store it without it just rattling around. So if you buy one of these, prepare for your top to get all scratched up. But if you're in a Jeep, you're probably not too worried about getting scratches on your car. So base price for the Sahara model, which this is, is just over $40,000. 
I think if you're gonna buy a Jeep, you might as well just buy it new because the used prices on these are so crazy. You're basically only gonna save a couple thousand dollars and get a car with 30,000 miles plus. So you might as well just get a brand new car, get the full factory warranty, and at least have a few years trouble free. Now, engine choices. I think this two liter, even though it has just about as much horsepower as the V6, it feels underpowered, like it's struggling. And it just has a horrible sound. It's like a ratchety, junky sounding car. <laughs> I think if you had other people in your Jeep, they'd be like, this is what the Jeep sounds like? So I drove on my last review, the 3.6 Pentastar that Mopar has. That's the other engine you can get in this. And I love that in the Charger. And I think it would be just as good in this car. And you would have the ability to modify it a lot more, which if you're in a Jeep, you're gonna modify it. So on that note too, you're gonna wanna probably add $10,000 to whatever price you pay for your Jeep because you're gonna get deep into the modifications. It's like a tattoo. When you get one, you're gonna want like your whole arm covered in tattoos. The Jeep's like that too. You put one accessory on it and then you're like, oh, I want this or I want the doors. I want the soft top. I want the better lights, which you're gonna need because while visibility during the day is really good, there's glass everywhere, open top. You can see everything at night. You really can't. I can't believe for a $40,000 car that Jeep didn't put HID headlamps in here. It still has the old halogens and they're tiny. The visibility at night is really bad and the visibility up back is bad at night too the camera while it looks good during the day there's no light on it at night so you're just looking at a black screen when you're backing up so the camera is pretty much worthless at night but all those things considered i still really like it it's a jeep this is the most i've ever took a jeep anywhere even though it was only like 100 miles i spent hour maybe five six hours in the car driving it because the road is so slow and you're going up and down these mountains one lane bridges and i thought we were getting really good gas mileage because the tank was at like three quarters still and then i realized we've only gone about 100 miles so according to the car i'm only averaging 16.1 miles per gallon so on top of that forty thousand dollars and the 10,000 accessories, add a little cushion in there for some extra gas money. That's it, I hope you enjoyed this Car Snubs road trip. If you liked the video, please subscribe, like, tell your friends, share everything. It's at Car Snubs on all social media. If you got any ideas for a road trip or another car that you'd like me to review, put that down below as well. Back to the airport, we made it safe. I forgot to give it a name, Gigi. Mm-hmm.